Tinakoto Katoa, Ko Karis Halliday Aho, and I'm the Technical Director of Accounting Standards at the External Reporting Board. And I am delighted to be joined in person today by Dr. Andreas Barco, the Chair of the International Accounting Standards Board. Welcome, Andreas. Thanks for having me, Chris. So we've had a few questions come in um, already, and we're hoping that you will have lots more questions that you'd like to ask Andreas. So please put those into the Q&A throughout the presentation um, as they occur to you, and then there will be time for questions as well at the end. Um, if you do have questions that are relating to a particular topic, if you note down the slide number that you'll see on the, the top right of the slide, then we can always jump back to that slide if we need to. So to get yeah. us um, kicked off, one of the questions we've had is how does the IASB plan to incorporate stakeholder feedback into its standard setting process? And I think that leads nicely into where you're going to begin. So over to you, Andreas. Absolutely. Thanks very much, Karis. And uh, good afternoon to everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you and uh, talk to you for, say, about the next 30 minutes or so before we open it up to questions. As Karis has just said, um, I um, could use that question, actually. Um, I, was almost, I was almost preempting it uh, by just pointing you at this slide. If you look at the circle, um, that depicts all the ISB's activities. You usually associate us with uh, developing standards, and that's a pretty good choice. Um, but that's not the only thing that we are doing. So, in fact, we are only, quote unquote, developing um, standards to about 50% of our time budget. Um, we spend about 20% of our time for stakeholder engagement, visiting jurisdictions, engaging with certain industries or with certain stakeholder groups, either in person or online. So this, this trip actually to New Zealand would be a very good example uh, of just this. Um, and um, we obviously get informed all the time about uh, people's concerns, people's wishes, people's suggestions and all of that. Um, outside uh, of the general consultation process that we have on top of that, obviously. So every time that we publish a discussion paper on exposure draft, obviously we are taking the stakeholder feedback on board. Whilst I'm at this slide, let me just continue uh, in, in saying a few things about this. 25% um, of our time goes into what we call maintenance and consistent application. That's to making sure that our standards are still bulletproof um, and respond to changes in the environment or to new transactions that we have seen coming up. Um, much of that is driven by the work of the Interpretations Committee. So if the Interpretations Committee can't resolve an issue, it would refer the issue to the board and usually that then leads to uh, narrow to scope standard setting. In the bottom left, you also see a quadrant called digital financial reporting. That's not quite up to scale. Um, we only devote about 5 to 10% of our time to digital financial reporting, but it's a pretty important bit um, because we believe that um, the future of prepar uh, preparation, but also the future of consumption of in financial uh, reporting information is really in digital format. It's no longer paper-based. If we move quickly to just uh, the right hand side of the table, you see the breakdown of our activities um, by topical areas. We currently have about 20 ongoing projects, but they don't um, have the same level of um, significance, nor are they in the uh, same state of maturity. So um, if we look into what we call our standard setting projects, um, all of the standard setting projects are preceded by what we call a research phase. The research phase is there for us to understand what the issue is and uh, whether we can find a standard uh, setting solution within um, a reasonable period of time. Um, if the answer to both questions is yes, then the uh, project will be moved out of the research uh, category and put into standard setting. So everything that you see right of that red bar has actually passed that test. Two recent projects that haven't made that, that cut, um, you see on the left-hand side. So our um, previous projects on extractive uh, activities and business combinations under common control, the board came to the conclusion that there is no way that we could actually resolve the issue um, in a reasonable period of time um, that would talk to um, the users of the financial statements and really move the needle. It's not to say that uh, we don't see that there is diversity in practice, there clearly is, but if you ask the question whether users are troubled by that diversity, the answer always was no. So, uh, and then 
uh, if we do have the objective of um, improving the decision-making basis for investors in global capital markets, and they say they are not disturbed by the diversity, then obviously this isn't a good use of our time and efforts. The project that you see on the right-hand side, I won't go through all of them uh, within these 30 minutes, um, but I would spend some time on um, the two that you see denoted here uh, in, uh, in red, or the three rather, financial instruments with characteristics of equity, business combinations, and primary financial statements. So primary financial statements, you see that uh, we have almost concluded our work. And um, in fact, that will be standard number 18. IFRS 18 is due to be published uh, in April next year, and uh, it has an effective date of 1st January 2027. So you will note that we give companies a good two and a half years plus uh, for implementation. But it means that the standard has to be uh, applied retrospectively. So it comes with um, comparatives so that the real transition date is 1st January 26. And we realize that some companies will have to undergo some significant system changes. And therefore, we thought that uh, two and a half years or two years and nine months was actually commensurate. There will be three main areas uh, for change in the standard. The first one is that we will be requiring uh, new subtotals. And uh, the most important subtotal is operating profit. Now, operating profit is being used by quite a few companies today, um, but it is used in an inconsistent way, both internally because uh, the definition is being changed from period to period. And it's also not comparable to other entities um, in other industries or across jurisdictions. So we will make mandatory how you have to uh, set up um, that subtotal. The second area is the disclosure about so-called management defined performance measures, sometimes also known as alternative performance measures or non-GAAP measures. We won't be regulating all sorts of non-GAAP measures, but we are all only concentrating ourselves on those non-GAAP measures that relate to the income statement. Um, the board has made a decision that it won't ban the use of non-GAAP measures in the financial statements, but um, if they are used, they have to come with a reconciliation to the nearest gap number, and you also have to disclose the income tax effect and the NCI effect so that users have uh, the opportunity to actually back out some of the numbers. The reasoning for us allowing the uh, MPMs is really, uh, again, based on user feedback. They have said, don't bend those. They're highly useful for our investment analysis because it gives us another data point next to the gap number. So we have two official um, data points. Both are being uh, audited, and then we can contrast these with our own estimate. The third area uh, concerns the grouping of information, and grouping is really a, a, um, a, an overarching heading for aggregation and disaggregation. So users have often said um, there is uh, insufficient information, particularly with those line items that are labeled other, like other expenses or other income, and entities stuff a whole lot of things into these line items where users say, we don't really know how to treat this item. So we will require further disaggregation, but we will also allow for or even mandate further aggregation if items are similar in nature uh, or insignificant in amount, and then they can be grouped together in order to tidy up the face of the statement. And there will be similar information needs with regards to the notes. Um, let me just point uh, you um, the, the the biggest change that uh, we were bringing about uh, as regards the um, statement uh, itself, the face. So you see um, basically the same line items that you know from IAS1, but we will group them now more officially in the three categories that you know from the cash flow statements or operating, investing, and financing. Yes, we do know that these categories do not completely talk to the categories, to the equivalent categories in the statement of cash flow projects. But um, um, as you will hear later in my presentation, we are about to start a project on the cash flow statement. And then we hope that we can reconcile at least a good deal of that. We won't be able to uh, reconcile everything. The biggest change probably comes for some entities that do have investments and associates and joint ventures that are being accounted for using the equity method. We are mandating that the results of those investments be presented outside of operating. And the key reason for that is that all the other items that you see on top of the operating profit line 
are gross items, whereas the um, equity method number is a net item. And investors have told us repeatedly that they want to be able to conduct margin analysis, and that can only be done if you don't commingle gross and net numbers, which is why the uh, net number has to go into another component, which means investing. This is just the uh, form that would apply to a general corporate. They are similar uh, um, formats for banks and for insurance companies, because um, obviously, if you are a bank, everything is operating, everything is cash, whether you invest or whether you take out money from customers. Um, so um, there are extra forms um, um, available in the uh, in the standard that would apply. If we can move on to the next project, um, which is business combinations, disclosures, goodwill and impairment, um, that's a bit further behind. We are about to publish an exposure draft um, probably in Q1 of next year. I think the current target date is March. Um, business combinations, um, you see the first um, heading is now disclosures rather than goodwill. Um, already alluding to the fact that we will not change the accounting treatment for goodwill. The board has made a, a unanimous decision, uh, or we had one um, um, uh, dissent uh, from that, um, where people have said um, we will not change the impairment only approach. And the reason for that is that um, our constituency really was split almost 50-50, and it didn't move the needle uh, from when we last consulted with our stakeholders five years ago, uh, where the split was probably 48 to 50, 52. So the board hadn't seen compelling evidence that the current model really was in need of change, and therefore it decided to stay where we currently are. So no change to the accounting for goodwill. Um, that doesn't mean that our job is done. We will bring some improvements to the impairment uh, test. We will bring some cost alleviations. The most significant one is probably the use of a post tax um, uh, for doing the impairment test rather than uh, the required pre-tax rate that we currently have in the standard. And there are some uh, minor improvements around the impairment test as well. The biggest uh, issue uh, will be around the disclosures, because if you ask investors um, where there currently is a deficiency uh, in terms of information that's being provided around business combinations. It's really around whether the combination has been a success or not. There's nothing in the disclosures that would talk to that. So we are going to beat that one up. And what is it that we are going to require? Well, it depends as to how significant the business uh, combination is. And we uh, distinguish between business combinations that are the material that you have to report on and those that are strategic. Um, you may punish us for the word using, uh, for us uh, using the word strategic because um, we're just coining another term here. But um, if you think about it, that the word significant um, is already used elsewhere in the literature, material we have already used in the literature, we have to come up with something else uh, that just denotes a certain subpopulation. And what we are meaning with the right hand uh, column is really those business combinations that would change the entire setup of the revenue stream of uh, a, a group. So for instance, you enter a new market or you take over a major competitor or you enter into a new product line or something like that. In that sense, the business combination is not just something that you do as a regular exercise, but really something that has the potential of strategically changing your combination um, of, your, of your business. Um, for strategic business combinations, we require more information and more detailed information than we do for all business combinations. So what we do want to know is uh, what synergies you expect and what the rationale for entering into the business combination was. And you see that for the strategic rationale, there is no exception. You have to provide that um, under all circumstances and there's no way out. Whereas for the synergies and for the objectives and targets for strategic business combinations, there is. We don't uh, just give a carte blanche for entities that they could omit these informations. Um, they have to give it unless it has the potential of seriously jeopardizing um, their future onward course of business. And the board thought about so-called serial acquires. That is, you're doing a business combination in certain tranches. And if you were to actually contemplate all the disclosures with the first tranche already, then you might actually um, lay bare 
your entire uh, strategic rationale for that, and that will uh, call into question uh, the entire series of business combinations. So therefore, we would give companies an exception, but um, you really have to prove on a one-on-one -on -one basis whether you qualify for the exception or not, just in order to make it a bit harder for entities. After the acquisition date, so in the next period or the periods that follow, you would have to give um, information as to whether your expected synergies uh, or your objectives and targets have been met. You, we are not asking companies um, to disclose any forward-looking information because next year you will have new information that pertains to that particular period, and that's to be contrasted with your original strategy. Uh, strategy. So it's all about um, de facto data, nothing to peek uh, forward. So we hope that this would actually be quite useful. The users love that. Um, the preparers hate it, uh, needless to say. So we had huge battles even on our board, and it was uh, difficult to find a compromise. But we, had, we have now landed in a place where both the users and the preparers are saying this seems to be a reasonable compromise. And obviously, we are very keen to get your input back to your question or the question of the submitter, Karis, um, at the beginning. So we want to get feedback. Moving on, financial instruments with characteristics of equity. This is about the split between equities and liabilities, um, a binary split. Many people have said this is no longer up to date. Uh, there are quite a few mezzanine instruments in the market. So why um, do we still rely on a binary split? Um, for those of you that have been around for quite some time, you may remember that there was a discussion paper published um, by the ISB uh, that took a rather revolutionary approach. Um, and it's fair to say that proposal was shot down unanimously. Nobody liked that. So we actually wrote back uh, and restarted the project and became far more modest and said, we don't want to toss up the general distinction between equities and liabilities. Uh, we just want to clarify um, application questions that we have received um, uh, repetitively, particularly the interpretations committee that was flooded at some time with certain fat patterns of some uh, complex uh, financial instruments where people didn't quite know whether these should be cla uh, classified as equity or liability or be split into the two components. So the areas that you see on the left hand side are areas that we are going to address. The intention of the board is not to change current practice, but we can't rule out that there will be changes for some. And it would be particularly uh, those entities that have sailed very, very narrowly at the fence, and they could find themselves now being placed on the other side of the fence, not in an effort to punish them, but to actually clarify a fuzzy gray area and make it uh, more applicable generally and hopefully the standard um, less complex. The um, publication date for that standard you see uh, is Q4 or the exposure draft rather. Uh, I can be a bit more precise if you can't wait. It's actually this Thursday. So mark your diaries and download the exposure draft. Over to the next category, um, to maintenance projects. I said that we devote about 25% of our time into these projects. Now, the majority that you see denoted here, um, it's only five um, projects. The majority of those are actually coming out of uh, discussions from the interpretations committee. If the interpretations committee comes to the conclusion that um, the fact pattern submitted cannot be reconciled back to the literature as it currently stands. The committee has only one way uh, to go, and that is it refers the issue to the board uh, for narrow scope standard setting. The board could then decide not to undertake standard setting, but to push it back down to the interpretations committee and to develop an interpretation. Over the past years, we have tried to avoid that path because we believe that it is clearer to clean up the standard itself rather than to put a plaster on it, which is an interpretation, because that just adds on to the complexity of our entire literature. Of the private projects that you see here, um, two are uh, seeing um, the publication of an exposure draft at this next stage. And I only want to talk about provisions uh, quickly and the climate related and other uncertainties in the financial statements. And let me start with the letter one. Um, 
when we did our agenda consultation, um, which is an effort that we have to do every five years, many stakeholders have mentioned climate risks um, in the financial statements as a topic the board should be looking at. Now, it's worth uh, pointing out that the uh, due date for that agenda consultation closed before the ISSB, our newly established standard setting board, had been established. And arguably, the ISSB deals with sustainability-related disclosures and would be far better housed in dealing with climate-related risk holistically. That doesn't mean that we could just lean back and say, OK, job done and deferred, let's move on. Because we believe that there are some legitimate concerns that for at least some entities, the information being disclosed in the notes may be insufficient or may be inconsistent with other assumptions being made in, the, um, in this area. So what is it that the board is actually doing? Uh, well, it's probably easier to say what we are not doing. We are not doing um, uh, developing a fully-fledged standard um, around climate-related risks. Firstly, we believe that this is really the area of the ISSB. But secondly, we truly believe that our standards are principles based. So um, you get the majority of the requirements in IAS 1, um, dealing with materiality, de uh, dealing with uh, areas of uh, significant judgment um, that would explain how you deal with any type of risk. If we devoted our time in developing a standard on climate related risk, I can already see people lining up and asking us, what about biodiversity? What about human rights? What about all the other ESG related risks? And we are saying we are risk agnostic. A risk is a risk is a risk is a risk. And you apply the general literature to any type of risk, regardless of what it is. If that has the potential of materially affecting your financial statements, you have to consider the risk. End of story. Um, now, that doesn't mean that we will not do anything, but we are contemplating whether we could actually put forward some educational guidance, probably an illustrative example that would demonstrate how you apply the general literature um, to the area of ESG related risks. And we might even contemplate some targeted standard setting if we felt that would be helpful and or necessary. Moving on to provisions, uh, that's one of the areas that has been on the work program for quite some time. Uh, it was slowed down uh, given the financial crisis first and then many of the other crises that we have seen. Also, many preparers were just going ballistic uh, about us changing uh, the scope of provisions because they uh, saw that they would probably be ending up with loads of more provisions. Now, that's not our objective to actually just enlarge the liability side of the balance sheet. But what we certainly can do is actually clarify um, some of the latent areas of IS 37. So, for instance, what does a present obligation mean? When do you have a present obligation? What does uh, no realistic alternative uh, mean to withdraw from that? So there are some areas that you see denoted here that we think we could actually clarify. And one of the areas um, is uh, targeted towards picking a discount rate and uh, clarifying whether it should be risk adjusted uh, or whether it should be a risk free rate. Now, you see uh, on the right hand side how we have so far responded to the issues. The first one with regard to recognition, we believe that we have actually um, uh, beefed up um, the, the area. We list three conditions here that we are proposing to bring into the standard, the strengths condition, the nature and the timing condition that basically just um, disentangle. Um, that one sentence in IS 39, I think paragraph 17, denoting uh, what a provision is and when you do have a liability that you should be accounting for by um, pulling the different pieces um, um, away from each other and bringing them into a hierarchical order. That could very well lead to pulling forward some of the obligations vis-a-vis -vis what we are seeing um, to date. Uh, so um, stay tuned. Just um, as part of um, this month's board meeting, the board has made a decision that we will be requiring the use of a risk-free rate. So non-performance risk will not be part of, um, of uh, the discount rate when it comes to measuring provisions. And the board has also decided uh, to stay away from an IS-19 approach. So using some sort of government uh, bond or commercial bond rate, um, we just say we refer to the risk-free rate um, that uh, seems to be the most promising route. 
Measurement, uh, which items um, uh, should be included in setting up a provisions is an area that we still have to discuss. So you, you may judge from that that the publication of an exposure draft is still a bit further away, but um, we are still positive that we can bring an improvement uh, to this area. Now, before I close and hand it back to you, Karis, um, let me just um, peek a little bit ahead of what's coming. And let me start by um, saying what's keeping me awake at night. So arguably the ISB is, if you look back for the past 20 years, a huge success story. To my knowledge, this is the only private organization that has been able to establish a global standard, a global reporting standard that applies to almost 150 jurisdictions around this globe. And this is just within the last probably 15 to 20 years, which is enormous success. But that's, that success comes with certain challenges because many people do have quite diverse expectations. They want you to deal with different issues. They want to uh, deal with different kinds of entities and different industries. Um, we have been made aware that some of the standards are so complex that particularly some emerging economies have difficulties in applying that because they're simply uh, a lack of expertise in that particular jurisdiction. Um, some other jurisdictions, probably more the developed ones, are threatening of carve outs because there may be certain provisions that they dislike. So the success, um, as nice as it is, always leads to challenges. And um, we try to balance that as best as we can. But I think uh, a lot of our efforts in stakeholder engagement really goes into explaining what we are doing and why we have done it and pointing out that if you go alone and try to uh, be opportunistic uh, just to your own jurisdiction, you miss out on the key benefit of there being a global standard. And I think that has to be our uh, paradigm really all the time that we have to reinforce with every deviation from the global standard, you make it one step harder for investors to invest into your country. And that's really the thing that we should all have on our radar. So um, just as I, and to depict that, what I said a bit more uh, promptly, we do have quite diverging economies. We do have G20 countries. We do have emerging economies, tiger states, but we also have a huge array of developing nations that arguably have far, um, dif uh, far different uh, issues and problems in their day-to-day -day life than, for instance, thinking about cryptocurrencies. Um, the companies in those jurisdictions may have a completely different level of experience and may have different resources available. So as to give you one example, we've been made aware that in Sri Lanka, there are only 10 actuaries in the entire jurisdiction. So how do you apply a standard like IFR 17 that's full of actuarial assumptions um, if there is a lack of expertise in that particular jurisdiction? And we may all smile about that, but to actually help those jurisdictions is really something that we need to have on our radar screen. Market objectives. We have been made aware of the fact that some jurisdictions have actually taken a step further than we thought. Our standards really are for profit standards, and they are meant to apply to consolidated financial statements. Quite a few jurisdictions are using the standards also for tax reporting, for prudential oversight, and in the statutory accounts, for instance, for dividend distribution determination. And obviously, this is taking the standards out of the context for which they have originally been developed. And this then by itself creates further challenges. Not all of the challenges can be addressed by the IASB, so we really rely on the entire ecosystem to work hand in hand. Some of the issues can be more effectively um, be dealt with by the audit profession or by regulators. Uh, some of the issues are really for us. Some we have to leave aside in just acknowledging, yes, we know that there is an issue, but there are higher priorities for us to resolve. So with my last slide, then, let me tell you what the future holds. I told you that we have 20 live projects. When we did our last agenda consultation, we got suggestions for a further 70 projects. Now, it goes without saying that we could not take 70 projects onto our work uh, program if we are already fully sold with uh, our 20 projects. So we said that we will make a quite a conscious decision. We only put two projects on our uh, research agenda, which are intangible assets and the statement of cash flows, which uh, received unanimous support across industries and across jurisdictions, which is very encouraging. The second project uh, that you see here, climate-related risks, 
are the one that we have started. And this is the one, the maintenance project that I have alluded to before. And then we've created a reserve list um, only for the purpose that if we should be faster in, in our standard setting work and have spare capacity, then we might look into any of these other two. But there was a clear expectation that we would only leave it to the 2.5. There's one exception, and that's polluting pricing mechanisms, because we have been made aware by many jurisdictions that this issue is actually rising exponentially. And if we are looking into climate-related risks, which arguably only looks at one side of the equation and not into the opportunities and carbon offsets and emission trading schemes, um, we should really um, uh, put this onto our radar as well. So the board uh, has just issued a call for evidence uh, to national standard setters around the globe to help us actually do a little bit of fact finding, telling us how prevalent the issue is. Um, and then uh, we will hopefully be in a position uh, sometime next year to make a decision whether we need to elevate uh, that project uh, into our active research agenda. With that, Karis, I know that was a, a path horse writ, but I think that um, we are now open for some Q&As. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. It was a great overview of what the IASB is focusing on and then all of those different factors that you're having to balance. So we've had some questions emailed in and then I see some are starting on the q and I'm going to start with the Q&A one, which I quite like, which is what is your favourite accounting standard if you have to pick just one? Okay, it has to be I for S9 because I did my PhD on financial instruments. <laughs> Sorry, Karis. I know that this was not the preferred answer. But it's not, that's a great standard. Not my favorite. Okay. You're allowed. <laughs> so another question is, how is the IASB managing the tension created between the time needed to support constant and comparable disclosures with the need for organizations to take urgent action and capital flows to support those actions? Well, that, I think that's a very good question. And to be honest, it's a constant balancing act. I mean, if you've just seen the slides um, um, where I noted the challenges and the different stakeholder groups that we are talking to, we have to bear in mind that if we touch a standard, we don't just touch it for those that have raised an issue with us, but we are touching it for everyone. So there is not one standard with 50 different variations. There's one standard, period. And that means if we are going to change the standard, we are changing it for everyone. So there is a very high hurdle uh, being put by our constitution. We have to have a super majority. And that, is, that means that we really have to be convinced that there is an issue that we need to tackle. Now, there are obviously constantly trends uh, out in the market and cryptocurrencies is a very good example of that, right? Crypto is in the headlines uh, all the time. But uh, people, and people have suggested that we take this on board. Now, we have asked people to actually give us evidence. How many IFRS preparing companies do you know that have material balances of cryptocurrencies? And the evidence was zero. Well, that's not good evidence, actually, for us to take on an issue. That doesn't mean that we completely ignore it. We do have a project um, underway, an internal project that we call horizon scanning. So we are constantly serving the markets and for trends that may actually uh, be relevant for us. So actually to abridge the time when it comes to making decisions. Um, but clearly, I mean, it is, it is an, a constant battle. Even if we take up something, probably keeping it uh, standard setting under a year is really a challenge because one thing I'm, I'm really not willing to do, and that is to compromise our due process. Every proposal that we put out has to be fully deliberated. It has to go through consultation. And we have to bear in mind that not everybody is speaking English as their first English language. So sometimes the documents need to be translated and we need to give um, stakeholders ample time to actually discuss that. So a great question, but no easy solution. Absolutely. Thanks for explaining that. Could you tell us more um, what you mean by a pollutant pricing mechanism? Was it one slide ago? So the pollutant pricing mechanism, we could just go back to that slide. Um, it carries various names, actually. Um, the, the board did have um, a previous project and even an interpretation that was withdrawn, if Rick free. Um, that was called emission rights or emission trading schemes. So pollution pricing mechanisms is probably just an umbrella term to denote all these uh, carbon trading uh, mechanisms. And there are mandatory schemes that many jurisdictions currently are bringing on uh, in order to transition to a greener economy. 
but there are also quite a few voluntary schemes where uh, people may uh, buy some sort of carbon offsets and many are doing that. And the question is, how should they actually be accounting for those? Um, what is the nature of these um, um, offsets? And how should they be measured uh, at cost um, or should they be uh, marked to fair value? Uh, should they be remeasured through PL? Should they be going uh, through OCI? So many questions that we are being uh, asked. And at the moment, obviously, there is a lack in the literature. You could probably come up with several treatments that are um, in line with the current treatment, but that then, uh, sorry, with the, with the current literature, but that then has the potential of creating quite some uh, diversity in practice. And the question is, should we not actually do something to preempt that diversity from spreading? Mm -hmm. Thank you. In New Zealand, we do have both a voluntary market and a mandatory with our emissions trading scheme. And we see diversity in practice here. Yeah. Um, it's a very topical. So another question has just come in, which is, is the IASB doing anything to address earnings management? Maybe potential quality of earnings metrics being disclosed? Um, well, one answer could be that I said, well, yes, we do. Um, with the publication of IAS 18, IFRS 18, uh, that's a good example, actually, of, of just saying um, how we how we address the the um, um, uh, the diversity that existed around um, the um, uh, presentation of operating profit, which arguably was a huge area in terms of um, putting out different um, earnings metrics. So companies would use that very selectively if they believe that um, intuitively their operating profit was too low, they would just exclude um, further expenses and they'd chop the number up. That obviously you could say is part of earnings management in by presentation. Um, as a general rule though, I would say our job is not really to prevent um, uh, bad behavior. If, if we made ba bad behavior the, the starting point of any standard setting, then we would really, um, I think, um, try to fix the 3% or 2% of entities that are going overboard and not doing anything for the uh, 98, 97% that really behave. I think um, this is a good example where the entire ecosystem has to come together. We are speaking constantly to the audit profession. We do have regular meetings uh, with large firms. We speak regularly with the uh, security market regulators. Um, and we are being informed as to what they are seeing, what we are seeing, and who needs to address what. Um, obviously, if we are seeing blatant uh, misuse of our standards, um, then we are thinking about actually uh, stepping in. But we believe that, first and foremost, this is really the job of the audit profession and the regulators, uh, and it's not so much the, um, the job of the standard setter, unless there was really ambiguity in the standard that needed to be taken out of the system. Thank you. And while we're on the topic of IFRS 18, I do have a question around what's happening to IAS 1 or what's the interaction here with IFRS 18? That's a good question. So IAS 1 will not survive as a standard, but the majority of the requirements that are currently sitting in IAS 1 and that are not dealt with by IFRS 18 uh, will be moved forward either into IFRS 18 or into IAS 8, the standard on accounting policies and accounting estimates um, and, and changes in those. So it depends a little bit whether uh, IAS 1 has something that's more accounting policy related, that piece will then move into IAS 8, but will move unchanged. Um, and the remaining areas will be put forward into IFRS 18. Thank you. Lots of great questions coming in. So we have five more minutes. Um, so do get your, your questions up there if you've got a burning question you'd like to ask. So this one's an, another really good one around um, how the ISB works and how do you work with other international boards such as the ISSB or the IPSASB or the IAASB? So the good thing is we work together. Um, we speak uh, with each other uh, regularly um, as part of the ecosystem um, uh, conversation that I was alluding to. Um, we don't have, say, monthly or weekly uh, meetings, so we usually uh, meet about once a quarter to keep ourselves updated about the other parties' um, work program, efforts, challenges that they are seeing and priorities, and to give them an opportunity to actually weigh in. 
But I think there is another question um, because we don't stop just at the global level. We also go one level down to the jurisdictional level. So we do have regular contact with national standard setters such as the XRB. Um, who, uh, we may contact either directly or through regional groupings um, that exist. So in, our, in your case, it would be the Asia Oceania Standard Setters Group that combines all the standard setters uh, from this region if they are a member to AOSSG. And uh, we are regularly having um, contact with the national standard setters. As I um, uh, keep referring to, they are you are really our eyes and ears on the ground. You see far quicker and far better uh, things evolving and bubbling up um, than, than we are seeing it even with our horizon scanning program. And I may be inclined to say that because um, before I assumed my current role, I was um, the head of the German Standard Center for six years. Thank you. That is good context as to how it all fits together. Uh, so another question is, can you provide an update on the role of management commentary? Oh, <laughs> another good one. So for management commentary, um, we have made a conscious decision to park that project uh, for an intermittent period. And the reason is that um, in our consultation on the exposure draft, we have heard from many stakeholders that they didn't want the IASB to um, develop that project further without um, consultation of the ISSB. Now, the ISSB was obviously quite occupied over the last 12 months in uh, finishing S1 and S2, which they have now done. And you may uh, be aware that they have just undergone an agenda consultation themselves that would inform um, the IS ISSB as to topics that they should devote their attention to uh, in the next three years. In that agenda consultation, uh, the ISSB did ask a question about integration and reporting, which has a leap into management commentary. Um, the two boards will discuss the feedback on that particular question jointly in a public session in January. And uh, we hope that we then be in a far better position to actually opine how we take management commentary further. It may go as a joint project. It may still be a standalone project because the ISSB says we have other priorities. It may end up as a retired project. We will just see. But as of now, it isn't dead. Mm. Watch the space. Yes. Excellent. So we have time for one final question, um, which is what's a recent example of how the Interpretations Committee and the IASB have worked together to resolve an accounting application challenge? That's a very good um, question uh, again. So you've seen in my maintenance slide um, the, the projects that we have there, and there are quite a few actually that have come out of uh, the pipeline from the Interpretations Committee. So power purchase agreements is a very recent one where um, the Interpretations Committee was presented with a fact pattern where it said, well, we can tell you what the current literature says, but the question is, does that really make sense? And the Interpretations Committee felt that this is something that really should be uh, elevated to the board. So the board has done some first high level uh, thinking about it, has done some research, has um, consulted with some of its advisory bodies that we do have, and the staff is now testing some of the ideas, uh, ideas back with the Interpretations Committee. So that shows actually it wasn't a one way street with the Interpretations Committee just saying over to you. But we are actually uh, tapping the expertise that exists, the practical expertise at the level of the Interpretations Committee uh, in trying uh, uh, to help us develop. Uh, a good solution. And uh, there are some other ones, if I think about um, our amendments to IFRS 9 uh, coming out of the PIR, some areas um, that, uh, again, have been flagged with the uh, Interpretations Committee, the so-called cash and transit uh, area, and when can you recognize a liability that you've put um, a payment instruction with your bank uh, is a recent one as well. So there is a constant flow back and forth between um, the, the two bodies. I should note that the Interpretations Committee's members are independent of the IFRS Foundation, so they are not paid by us. They are a really independent uh, body, but um, the IASB needs to ratify all um, their technical decisions that they are making. Thank you. That's great context. And that was our last question. So thank you so much for your time today and sharing the insights. It's great to have you in New Zealand. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Have a good rest of your day. Cheers. Bye.